Welcome to the J3 University Podcast. I'm your host, John Jewett. And I'm your co-host, Luke Miller. Our mission is to elevate the physique coaching standard. And deliver the highest level of competitors to the stage. Let's jump into today's episode. Insulin sensitivity. What is what a buzzword in the bodybuilding community. We all want to get more of it, right? Do we need it? Does it matter to us? Or are we looking at, is this the chicken egg scenario that you stay lean and in turn you stay more insulin sensitive? Or is it that when you're insulin sensitive, you stay lean? Ah, we're going to find <laughs> out. That's what we're going to talk about. So uh, with uh, this is constantly talked about and whether, you know, being more insulin sensitive, you have better muscle gaining ability and, and less partitioning towards fat gain. It's things that we should be addressing, but I would say, it might be a misguided just assessment of when someone is uh -huh. seeing better progress and staying leaner and has a good off season that in turn, when they look at lab work, they're also insulin sensitive. Uh -huh. Could be. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, no, go ahead. Go. No, maybe defining just around this of like <sighs> insulin sensitivity is not clearly defined within even the, the clinical literature usually we're looking yeah, at more not. disease states around yeah. insulin resistance being just this reduced responsiveness to the target tissues for uh, normal insulin levels right so we have just our cells and we need to uptake glucose you have insulin receptors on said cells uh, insulin binds to these receptor sites and you have this uptake of glucose. Well, insulin resistance occurs when that insulin signal is now being impeded. And so you now are not uptaking as much of this glucose and in turn, uh, insulin levels rise because it's trying harder to push this glucose into cells and it's not doing it. So then we see further elevations in blood glucose, which results in insulin resistance, or we just flip the term around and you say loss of insulin sensitivity. <laughs> So is, is this a, a problem? And it absolutely is a problem because once you go there, it's, well, it's a disease state where we have prediabetes mm -hmm. that leads into diabetes, which is one condition contributing around overall cardiovascular disease. I, I don't yeah, want this to turn into some big like health lecture because I want to talk about more about physique progress though. Yeah, so I mean, the primary uh, consideration to think about with this is, one, are you making the most out of your bodybuilding progress? And then two, are you doing what you can to limit the health ramifications that come with insulin uh, uh, desensitization, I guess you would say, um, issues with insulin sensitivity? Um, and, and, and mainly you're pulling that evidence from, like you mentioned, some of the cardiovascular disease states, potentially kidney issues that are going to be coming from these populations with uh, you know insulin sensitivity problems. However, when we look at like optimizing the physique progress, to me, a lot of it comes from one, not making preps miserable, two, not wasting time from a physique progress perspective and waffling, on, waffles my word today, waffling on in an off season uh, setting where you've probably pulled the most out of it at the 17, 18 week out mark, but because your timeline says 24 weeks, you're just gonna keep getting fatter for six more weeks. And if we look at it in like, ask better questions about how do we prevent it and how do we measure it and how do we make decisions on changes and plans? This is where understanding everything in this unbelievable new glucose management lecture will help you manage it and make better decisions for your clients to make their time duration of progress to get to their goal shorter because you're more efficient in your week to week decision making. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's the, for sure the health reasons around managing this yeah. and, and it's, it's like I bring up in this lecture it's like one small component around you know developing insulin resistance amongst numerous other factors that contribute to high risk in bodybuilding with us actually kind of mirroring uh, individuals with metabolic syndrome where insulin resistance is part of this, also increases in waist circumference, which is associated with increased visceral adipose tissue gain. Uh, then you have like dyslipidemia and hypertension occurring, but usually obesity. However, we have a lean phenotype, but also we have all these other metabolic disturbances occurring, insulin resistance being one of them. Uh, what's the problem with being 
having metabolic disturbance. Well, that is the case when you get into suboptimal ability to manage your carbohydrates, your fats, and your protein. And uh, if you're running into deleterious health effects, you're now causing uh, shortening of this off-season progress that, that could happen to you. You could now have to put in the back end of your health health recovery phase, well, your health phase, maybe your uh, less <laughs> less dying phase, right? Or whatever you want to say. Uh, so, so there's that part of, of progress as well. But also I think if you're doing the things you need to uh, from kind of like conducting your bodybuilding like you are an athlete, then uh, you're not going to run into much of these issues at bay. And I, I do go into in depth of like how do you actually assess this which there's a few different ways. Typically, um, some people are just looking at A1C, which is a very reasonable rate. It's how we diagnose diabetes. It's, mm -hmm. it's going to show your average blood glucose exposure across the past three months, looking at fasting to prandial levels, which gives a pretty good reflection around your glucose control. The only issue with A1C is that it is delayed a bit. So once you actually see A1C rising, that likely you've had high blood glucose and insulin levels for a while, now running into showing this A1C. So we could even in our lab work be pulling also a blood glucose and insulin level and, and calculating a HOMA IR, which uh -huh. is a, a modeling method to determine how insulin resistant you are. And maybe through all this, we can kind of get, get paint a picture of what is your insulin sens sensitivity state or your uh, insulin resistant state. And there's a lot to discuss around that. So please dive into lecture because we could do a whole lecture just purely on that. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's uh, also just not about just getting to, I'm eating too many carbohydrates that run, run yeah. into this issue. It's uh, numerous variables that can run into this issue. I think if you're doing things right, then you won't run into the problem, which we're going to talk first about just, uh, now, the number one thing, if you want to keep insulin sensitivity, is body fat. Uh, we see the people that have greater degrees of increases in body fat mm -hmm. are is pretty much one of the mechanisms that run into insulin resistance. When you have fat cells expansion, your fat cells, they're not benign just storage units. They actually produce hormones, and some of these are called adipokines which as you expand these fat cells, they start releasing more adipokines that are pro-inflammatory. And these pro-inflammatory adipokines actually interfere with the insulin signaling pathways. And you're looking at kind of the root mechanism around developing insulin resistance, one, one of them. Also, when you expand your fat cells, you have fat cells overflowing into the serum and free fatty acids also cause an impedance in cells for insulin signaling pathway. If you think about, you will use what you have available, right? So if your fats, if your muscle and liver and all these other cells have fatty acids available, they're gonna say, well, hey, I don't need to take up glucose. I have all this fat available. So you in turn are creating this insulin resistant um, uh, process. So getting too fat is the, the main, main thing around staying lean. This would be your number one strategy for guarding your insulin sensitivity. So I'd say staying lean first comes with how you're going to gain insulin sensitivity. It's not you're insulin sensitive and that's how you stay lean. So uh, it, it very well is not a chicken egg scenario. It is one that comes prior to the other. But this is where it really comes down to managing your surplus in that sense mm -hmm. and where we see people kind of go wrong in the off season. They're just gaining fat at too quick of a rate. And then what happens well, what does insulin resistance kind of look like is uh, some, you're all of a sudden you feel more watery and you're like having more like kind of joint swelling. Your appetite starts getting really crap. Um, you're losing pumps in the gym. You might feel more lethargic throughout the day. Energy is dropping off. So all these things are starting to crop up, which just creates now this very suboptimal place to train at, recover from, and it really then in turn is kind of like bringing about, hey, you need to do a dieting phase, drop off some body fat. Yeah, and I think I think your rate of fat accrual is the one that I want to kind of touch on because I we have to accept some level of body fat accrual across the surplus phase, right, in order to create progress. I think there's decisions that clients can make that can limit how 
excessive that rate of fat gain is. And there's decisions that coaches make that can limit how fast that rate of gain is. So let's start with the client side. Um, on the client side, it's going to be largely just cheat meals. Like what do those look like and how much of a caloric intake is that on a week to week basis? Um, it, it is of my opinion that if you are wanting to pull the most out of your physique progress and it compete at the highest level or one of the highest levels that we should not just be going out for cheat meals off the rails, not tracking in some manner the majority of weeks. Maybe let your hair down once every five to eight weeks and, and do that. But this is going to be where repeated outings along large caloric intakes of processed carbohydrates with high levels of fat intake together is going to increase that rate of fat accrual and potentially shorten these off season phases on the coach's side. And I think this is, this is one of the best takeaways I think in, in level two is the rate of caloric increase in off seasons that has to occur across a long duration of time, because you don't go from <laughs> consuming 3000 calories to all season starts, you go to 4,500, right? And that's just like going to hold you throughout the entirety of the off season phase. And I think there's some decision making things on the coaching side that can help with making sure that the client's uh, you know, adherence is where it needs to be. They're doing macro substitutions correctly, but also the changes you make to keep them from getting into fat accrual rates that are too high. Yeah. I think with, with the cheat meal, basically eventually some people in the off season, I've, I've seen this is that they have one meal that is so far uh, in excess that that is their weekly weight gain just for the week off that one day. Like you'll see body weight jump up one or two days after and it just holds there the rest of the week and doesn't move. And then the rest of the week, you have to make their diet at maintenance calories just because otherwise they're just going to be gaining even more body fat. And so you have to say, hey, wouldn't it be better if you took that calorie excess off that one day and you spread it out across the entire week where you were able to better fuel training and then also better uh, fuel like the recovery process. And then hey, have the, more of this linear increase across the week. And, and absolutely that would be better because I've coached this and it just gets to where people are not making a lot of progress and just getting really fat. So that yeah. just leads to the, the further uh, loss of this insulin sensitivity. But really it's just managing about uh, just your calorie surplus so you, you don't get too fat. Um, on the other side of the equation, I would bring up, Luke, is that you also need to manage your uh, caloric output as well. Uh -huh. And that's really the issue of people becoming inconsistent in the off season, like they were in prep where, all right, every day I'm going to get 8,000 steps in and I do cardio on these days. We just start seeing just things slip in that process to where, Oh, you know what? I just uh, got busy and I got social and now I can get all my steps in. And then that in turn on that day, it actually leads to a greater calorie surplus than you intended. You keep doing that over time and you're now exceeding your rate of weekly gain that was had the had the balance of fat and muscle gain and now you're starting to kind of swing the pendulum more into a bit of that fat gain which all it does is cut your off season shorter so with this, these takeaways is that you need to be consistent with managing that calorie surplus not only through your intake but also through your output as well yeah and i think it i mean the output side of the equation is going to help you with managing some of the health you know, considerations as well that could potentially shorten an off season too, which um, is only going to be beneficial in extending that in, in other areas. But I do think to kind of move into the next thing we do need to consider is stress management. I think stress management is huge stress management and sleep uh, in order to kind of help with this response to food and consistency with response. Um, especially when we talk about like consistency and sleep schedules and keeping that in a duration that's going to be long enough um, in order to uh, not see this uh, fluctuation in response to food kind of on the day to day, because like the more we go into, you know, short sleep times and like five hours and that response to food on like the day to day and the week to week is going to get get worse. And this is where you'll see it on both sides of the equation. It's like someone that's and this happened to me. I don't know if you remember, but when I was working strength and conditioning at USF, it's like I was up at 4 a.m. and I was going to bed at 10. And it's like 
that did not bode very well for my physique progress during that all season. And it was just reflecting classic issues with insulin sensitivity and stringing along an all season long enough. Thanks everyone for tuning in to today's podcast. Are you struggling to hit your peak on show day? Feeling lost in the off season? Upgrade your coaching game with J3 University. Our program covers everything from off season to contest prep to peak week, all based from real client results. Along with our comprehensive physique curriculum, you'll also get access to our four rooms with our J3 team to answer any questions you have and live Q&A sessions to further your coaching and athlete experience. We are the source of education for top IFBB pros and coaches. Join us to elevate the coaching standard at J3 University. Let's get back to today's podcast. Yeah, both have major players in this, and I think that mm -hmm. is where some people lose that consistency in going to bed mm -hmm. at the same time, waking at the same time, and allotting that same amount of time to be in bed, then also just trying to take on more work that – they weren't able to do like even in a contest prep. Um, but even out, outside of that, it's like you're, we should always trying to be moving towards a healthier state uh, physiologically mm -hmm. and psychologically and just having a very stressful job in general. Uh, it's been shown there was a, they've looked at this in like large worker populations that those that had less job security and, and higher stress positions and workloads um, had higher cortisol levels and it also correlated with higher uh, HOMA IR scores. So they were just more insulin resistance because of this. And we see that, that that rise in cortisol level actually impacts lots of aspects around managing blood glucose for one uh, decreases pancreatic beta cell insulin secretion, um, increases your liver liver's production of glucose and also decreases your glute four translocation um, in, in skeletal muscle cells to uptake that glucose. So all in turn, it requires uh, higher, higher insulin levels to manage the same amount of blood glucose from this cortisol level coming up from all the stress you're incurring from work. And this, same thing kind of occurs with sleep. It's kind of like well, what's coming first and one just kind of snowballs into the other, right? You have stress, you can't sleep at night, but then you don't sleep at night. So the next day you're tired and everything is more irritating stress. and then you're more stressed. So it just kind of compounds. But even one hour of sleep loss in a caloric deficit can lead to less fat lost and more muscle mass lost. Now in an off season setting, that same thing can happen in reverse where you can lead to that calorie surplus leading to more partition of proportion of fat being gained and also less proportion of muscle being gained. So managing your sleep and your stress is vastly important if you're trying to pull out the most muscle gain possible while minimizing fat gain. And I feel like these areas are the ones that, especially the lifestyle and stress component, are really the ones that lag for mm -hmm. a, a lot of people. I, I, I've had a few clients where the the work stress is so high and just hard positions or even shift work positions that it's it's not even necessarily the the work stress. It's just the change in the daily routine is so vast that we get to points where they're kind of at their ceiling for in a prep for one how lean they're going to be able to get where you just see them just kind of stay there or they just get a smaller version of themselves or even off season where like, man, I feel like they're only getting softer when I'm adding in food and we're not seeing it translate to increases in gym performance because the work lifestyle is not managed properly. And so mm -hmm. this is vastly huge. And in, in J3, we have a whole lecture dedicated to sleep and a whole lecture dedicated to stress because it's that important. Um, yeah. And I think it's, I think it's so undervalued and I've seen processes, both directions be derailed, but especially within like being able to manage an all season for people that aren't willing to take the health risk to the highest level. It's like, they don't want to see uh, any of the potential down regulation or minimized version of that. It's like, man, it's just going to make health management just that much harder. Um, and it's really can, can kind of screw that up. But I do think it, it might be worth touching and wrapping up with a little bit of potential PD application and kind of what this may look like from a coaching perspective. Yeah. Sure. I, mean, I think when we dive into the PD aspect where we are looking at 
the bodybuilder that's enhanced in this course is not, of course yeah. you're not going to be taking PDs if you're a natural. And I want to bring up the point, if you're a natural and you're staying less than 20% body fat, most of this conversation doesn't impact you. Like if you're lean and you're not imposing yourself with these other steroids and growth hormone, you're not going to have to worry about monitoring your blood glucose. And uh, a lot of the areas that PD user would have to, um, However, a lot of a few things that we do mention, like what your diet should comp be compromised of and your rate of gain, uh, sleep and stress management, like absolutely those all apply amongst all of us. But when we get in the PD side, it gets a little bit more specific for the actual PD user, of course, um, with and, and there's a few crossovers here with naturals that I see them using, which I don't think always should be utilized because with someone that's also using PDs, they're also using growth hormone. Uh, but also it's not only raising blood glucose, you're also uh, creating a lot of inflammation in the body, lots of oxidative stress as well. So there's this other aspects that are occurring along the way. So we should have components that should probably protect us or prophylactically try to mitigate some of that. Uh, for one, just looking at your, your lab work and seeing if you have any micronutrient derangement occurring, which vitamin D has a huge role in managing insulin and blood glucose. So does your magnesium levels and your zinc levels. So those are areas that you would want to be assessing, at least in lab lab work, um, even making sure you have adequate, usually it's not a problem, but adequate sodium as there's sodium glucose transporters that require sodium also to transport glucose. So that would be important as well. And so those are at least some other like vitamins, uh, vitamins, but, but minerals that would translate over and vitamins that would translate over to your naturals. But we get into the, the PD side too. Um, if you're using growth hormone, the, the biggest main issue of people using growth hormone is going to be insulin resistance from, from the health point of view. Uh -huh. And that mainly comes from growth hormones ability to increase free fatty acids in the serum. Just like when you get overly fat, it's kind of the same mechanism of action. And these free fatty acids are what in, are impeding the signaling, insulin signaling. So one thing that I think is a great addition with growth hormone usage is injectable L-carnitine. Because uh, injectable L-carnitine, it, it has its aspects for um, its role in muscle recovery as well. But its main job is transporting these fatty acids that are now floating around these muscle cells into the mitochondria for oxidative, oxidation to occur. And so it, it has also been shown like using carnitine has improved A1C levels as well. So the insulin sensitizing properties of it are, are great, especially compared with growth hormone as that's the main mechanism driving insulin resistance in, in uh, this situation. Uh, another one that gets brought up a lot is metformin. Uh, with, right. with metformin usage, you're not only addressing... Uh, insulin sensitivity, but also has a role in decreasing inflammation and also oxidative stress in the body. Some people bring up, hey, metformin is going to decrease my muscle gains. Yep. And there's not evidence of this, of course, not in super physiological bodybuilders using steroids and growth hormone and, and all these degrees. And there's actually a study, an interesting one I bring up in our, in our lectures around diabetics using uh, metformin or metformin with growth hormone. And you know what happens? The individuals using the, the metformin and growth hormone, their IG flavin levels are like 400 nanogram per mil, which is super physiological. And they're only using like three IUs of growth hormone. So it doesn't impede IGF-1. This is not a concern for us when we're using GH or steroids. Um, but metformin has the best clinical evidence. It's a first line therapy for diabetics. And as little as 500 milligrams has great efficacy for improving A1C. So th this could be a tool to be utilized. It's not gonna be a tool for everyone to be utilized and, and, and why I, I break down the pros and cons of it in this lecture. And along that same line is berberine, which berberine is very, very similar to metformin. It has a little bit more role directly with uh, the insulin receptor. However, we just don't have as much data on it as we do to metformin. So some people make claims like, oh, met, uh, berberine won't impact your IGF-1 levels, but metformin does. It's just that we don't have the, the studies that actually have looked at that to be able to say so. 
So, and then I see naturals that because we're looking for all the, the natural aspects to be utilized over pharmaceutical, that many naturals are using GDAs or berberine, but you might also be using too many things that are now trying to offset inflammation and oxidative stress that you're not incurring like a PD user. And these could potentially be what you'd say a little bit uh, catabolic in a sense. So, but you're also, if you're a natural and you're lean, you won't have these issues of insulin sensitivity and you'd be optimal in uptaking glucose. So a berberine for many naturals just doesn't have an application for, for that individual. Um, some other ones that we get into in the lecture would be, hey, inflammation is a problem. Uh, curcumin has really good evidence for super, supporting lowering of inflammation and turn improving insulin sensitivity. I think we should address the other pillars that we run into also with like sleep issues and stress management with like ashwagandha having good application there. And even tutka is another one that I would bring up a lot. I think people just think liver. Well, I, well my liver's not going under stress. <laughs> Absolutely it is. But also your liver's your main site for glucose and fatty acid metabolism. And we see yep. tutka has, has great roles in improving insulin sensitivity actually. Just a lot of people kind of use uh, too low of dosages doing it. That a final one I'll bring up that you, uh, people can think on too is like if you're also someone that, for one, if you're that bodybuilder with that metabolic syndrome profile and you're running a bit hypertensive, that if you have a choice to make around a blood pressure management, telmosardin still stands out as, as one that shines as it has, uh, it's a partial agonist of the PPAR gamma pathway, which this pathway has a role in improving insulin sensitivity. So not only are you having a blood pressure medication that would improve blood pressure, but also improve insulin sensitivity as well through a different pathway from these other things that I have mentioned. So we're kind of striking in this multiple pathway sense of, of improving uh, insulin sensitivity. Uh -huh. So those are just a few, and there's also some stack design things that we can consider, but I think that kind of draws out the conversation maybe a bit too Not long too today. Uh, but yeah. I think just the initials of what we might have in place um, yeah. would, would be there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, I think that covers it mostly because a lot of it is just going to be managing the client week to week that uh, understanding that you have these tools in your tool bag, understanding like when to pull labs and, and kind of walking through that process of all the tools that you have for glucose management. It's all kind of built out in that lecture so that you have it ready to use when you need it. And just uh, like the anecdotal thing, like this off season has been very productive for me. And I've, people ask like, what, what's the deal? It's like, well, I take a lot of drugs now, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but like part of it to where I've been able to keep string weeks together is that I just closely managed my calorie surplus and week to week I had, mm. uh, you know, about maybe a one pound body weight increase. That's not the, the rate to quote for everyone, but I wasn't getting fat on a week to week basis. And so I would just keep going with that. And I wasn't having meals that would drive my surplus way up. And I was very consistent with my energy mm -hmm. output to where I would get very predictive and knew like my, what my rate would be. And by staying leaner, my health markers stayed great. Um, I could run, you know, a, a large amount of growth hormone and I could pull my labs. My A1Cs actually went down during this growth phase. And I just come doing all the things that we talked about here. And so you absolutely can manage your health variables and make a drastic improvement in your physique uh, by doing these things. And so I know a lot of people want to know what to take. You mentioned, I, I wouldn't even talk about exogenous insulin, but you know, this is a, a tool to be utilized, but it's, it's one of the, such a smaller one. It's, it's nearly uh, uh, questionable whether it's e even that important to, for, um, for the bodybuilder. And so that's, I know that's going to be just open a can of worms with that statement, but uh, maybe, maybe for another day, but yeah. being, being here, like the, the big picture is like I said, manage your body fat, your rate of surplus. That's going to do a whole lot before you reach to what do I take? What is the GDA? What is the insulin? What is that protocol? It's, it's usually more of the things that you need to be doing over what you need to be taking uh, to make the biggest impacts here. So this, uh, Lecture was nearly three hours long that I put together. So if you see Luke and I trying to condense this information down into like 30 minutes, it just, it just won't cut it. So please, if this is a topic that you're thriving to learn more about, uh, 
dive into level one where we have it all laid out for you. But we will wrap it up there. Thank you all for tuning in. And we will talk to you next time.